will be. This is Cisco. Hello and welcome to Networking Field Day 19. We are here this morning with Cisco. We've got some brand new special announcements coming your way from the folks at Cisco. This is a great time. We get a, a chance to kind of see what's on the horizon for technology and it's a great opportunity for the folks around the table uh, to kind of give you their thoughts and their feedback about what's going on. Uh, it looks like we're going to be talking a little bit about SD-WAN. Uh, that's a hot new topic that I think a lot of people are very interested to learn a little bit more about. Cisco's had a really great um, history with SD-WAN for a long time, both you know uh, back when it was kind of at the forefront of the technology with their iWAN product, but also now that they've uh, acquired Viptela. In fact, I see some of my Viptela friends hanging out in the back. We're probably going to hear from them pretty soon. So um, you're going to want to stay tuned to this uh, whole presentation. We've got a lot of great content headed your way. You can interact with us right now. It's really easy to do. All you have to do is get online and go to uh, Facebook Live, where you're probably watching this video right now. Um, you can leave comments on this video. You can also get on Twitter. Uh, tweet out your thoughts using the hashtag NFD19. Uh, we'd love to hear what you have to say about this, what your perspective is on everything. Um, this is going to be a really great time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our host here at Cisco because I know they've got a lot of great content coming your way. We're going to be going for two and a half hours this morning, so we've got a lot of great stuff coming up. So don't miss it. All right. I'm going to hand this microphone to you. Thank you. And then we'll head to the back. Thank you, Tom. Great to see all of you. Um, I just got reminded of the fact that it was exactly two years ago that this crew was talking to us, grilling us, asking a lot of nice questions, <clears throat> and out came a whole bunch of new innovations from there. So first off, I want to thank you guys for doing this. Uh, we have a lot of new and exciting stuff to talk about today around uh, SD-WAN, the whole evolution that we are seeing with respect to cloud, security. We're not just going to talk about it. We're going to show this in action as well. So a lot of demos today for sure. Right? So let me uh, introduce myself, uh, Ramesh Prabhagaran. I run product management uh, for Cisco SD-WAN. I come in through the Viptel acquisition, which is where I met you guys last. Uh, I was running product management there. And we have a, an all-star crew today, from Rohan to David to Hamza to Corelli to like a whole bunch of folks that will be talking about uh, SD-WAN and all the innovations there. Let me help just set up the problem and, and kind of where we are. Uh, and then I'll turn it off to, uh, to, to Rohan to go through the, the rest of the details. So uh, back in 2016, and I'm not going to go too far back, uh, just go back to 2016. Uh, it was really early stages, I would say. Right, The technology was, was there. Uh, early customers had deployed it. That's the phase that I would call as the SD-WAN uprising, right? Like the first hundred customers who re like really dived deep into the into the pool were able to see the value of that, and and they were able to deploy as well. The genesis of SD-WAN, as we all know, uh, was really around how do I take expensive MPLS circuits, add to broadband, and build a fabric out of that, and and get the cost efficiencies and the and the cost arbitrage that came with it. Uh, along with that, we saw a whole bunch of deployments around segmentation. Um, how do I do mergers and acquisitions? How do I segment my network for line of business, for compliance, and so on and so forth? So those were kind of the, the early adopters of the technology really focused on, on, on this, along with kind of how do I bring business partners into the mix and, and give them access to the infrastructure. So this was two years ago. Uh, last year uh, was, was is the phase I would call as SD-WAN maturing, uh, mainly because there were a couple of acquisitions, the pioneers who actually uh, jumped into the deep end of the pool were able to see the deployments uh, work and, and were able to scale it to like thousands of sites in, in some cases as well. And the focus at that time was, okay, now I got the cost arbitrage and the efficiency is there. How do I get security to work? How do I do a direct internet access into Office 365? And how do I... Uh, have an on-ramp into, into AWS, Azure, and, and so forth. So, those, so DIA and DCA were really key topics of, of conversation uh, amongst all of our customers uh, last year. Uh, and so we built a lot of technologies and innovations around that. Um, it was also the time that managed service providers, large telcos in particular, jumped in and said, hey, I have a, a managed service offering. So if you are an enterprise customer, 
you can actually get this as a service from me. I'll give you the circuit, I'll give you the managed capabilities on top. You don't have to worry about your network irrespective of whether it's 100 sites or thousands of sites. Um, and with that also came kind of virtualization. Now I have a really cool technology in the form of SD-WAN. I'll bring uh, security into the mix, I'll bring elements of optimization, and I'll offer everything in a virtualized form factor. So that was last year. Fast forward to this year, I'm sure many of you have seen the stats around this. Uh, in the next two years, 90% of the enterprises are going to make a decision on SD-WAN. It's, it's no longer a question of if, it's purely a question on, on, on when. And, and that's one of the reasons why you saw Gartner as well issue the magic quadrant. Uh, and, and, and it helps separate, how I would call, the men from the boys. Um, there are a few vendors who show up on, on the top right because they have the credibility and, and the deployments to show. This year, every single WAN conversation that we are having inside of Cisco, and, and as Cisco, you should expect us to be like in the, in the, in the table at least on, on many of these WAN conversations, every single one of those WAN conversations is an SD-WAN conversation, right? Across every vertical, uh, be it uh, public sector uh, or, or, or utilities, retail, manufacturing, financials, and, and so forth. So every single one of them is a WAN conversation. And there are two things in particular that keep coming up time and again. One is, how do I use this opportunity to revamp my security architecture entirely? and how do I build efficient on-ramps into the cloud? So all the innovations that we will talk about today and show you in action are going to be revolving around what are we doing with respect to cloud, what are we doing with respect to security, while at the same time making sure that you get a really good view into how we are we migrating customers from their traditional network architecture to the architecture of today. So those are the kind of the, the main topics that, that we have. I'm going to turn this over to Rohan, who will talk about the problem and what we are doing about it as well. Rohan? Thank you, Ramesh. Uh, before I get started, quick introduction. My name is Rohan Grover. I'm part of the product management team uh, in SD-WAN. And I'm going to double click into a few of the things that Ramesh was talking about, specifically around the new innovations on security and multi-cloud. And is there a clicker here? So uh, this picture is, should be fairly familiar to you guys. Um, we, are, we are in a world, I'm sorry, this. We're in a world where your traditional campus and branch is no longer the same. We're in a world where you have mobility that is pervasive everywhere. IoT devices are becoming the norm. Um, everyone is, wants to connect to everything at any point of time on any device. And our traditional concept of where applications sit is fundamentally changing. There used to be a time when it was a data center and a private cloud. It's no longer that. You still have that along with things like IAS and SaaS. And it is truly a multi-cloud world. With all the conversations we've had with our customers, more than 85 to 90% of our customer base is looking to have applications in more than a single cloud. Right? So everybody's looking at whether it's AWS or Azure or Office 365 or Salesforce, there are multiple clouds. Now, the WAN is really the, the connecting fiber between all of these. And, and this connectivity is no longer through, internet, uh, through MPLS circuits. We are depending on internet connectivity, and internet connectivity is now becoming business critical. Like it's no longer a best effort kind of transport anymore. Uh, enterprises are looking at internet as the way to access their applications across the multi-cloud. Now this becomes important because when you're doing this, you have to ensure the same level of reliability as well as security over the internet links that you expected over MPLS. And you're talking about enterprises that have few campuses, hundreds of branches, and thousands of users that are all, mo that are all mobile. Right? So this is a fairly complicated problem statement that we're trying to solve. And all of these interconnections are making life harder for network administrators, not necessarily easier. The cloud makes users' lives easier. It doesn't necessarily make the network administrator's life easier. Yes. So yeah, I, was thought, I thought you had a question. Nope, I'm <laughs> listening intently, though. Uh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Wait, so the new paradigm that we see is that there is certainly this gap between users, devices, IoT things, and the multi-cloud. And this gap is creating a new paradigm called the cloud edge. The cloud edge, in our mind, is where networking and security and cloud all come together. 
right? And this is going to become, or this is currently the new battleground on on the WAN side, right? And we need to figure out how we are going to protect the cloud, cloud edge. There's clearly a level of exposure now with internet becoming pervasive and business critical that didn't exist in the past. So security is fundamental to securing the cloud edge. Application experience, MPL has provided you a guaranteed SLA and metrics because you were paying for that. The internet is no longer that guaranteed purveyor of SLAs. We have to make sure that the experience is consistent, whether you're going over an MPLS circuit or whether you're going over an internet circuit. And it has to be the, give you the same level of performance characteristics that MPLS used to give you. And complexity, of course. Uh, you have to make sure that the WAN is intelligent enough to be able to take the best part with the most secure part to anywhere you want to go. So let's dive into the security piece of this. How do we do security today in a branch? There's typically four ways of doing security in a branch, and I'll go over all of them, and there's pros and cons to each of them. So the, the traditional way of doing it is you want to get access to the internet. You basically go from your branch location, backhaul it to your data center, and then go to the internet. Now, there's pros and cons here. Security is easier here because your security perimeter is actually in your data center, and you have all of your security appliances sitting there. Uh, the user experience is not as good. Uh, when you're going to a SaaS application or to the multi-cloud through a data center, you're going to have performance implications. The second way that we would do this is through cloud security. Let the security be handled directly by the cloud. There are a number of vendors out there that say that we can handle your security. You don't actually need security sitting in your branch. You can do it all in the cloud. Now, while that may be fairly simple, there's not any effort required by the enterprise to do this. A lot of large enterprises get very nervous when you talk about essentially outsourcing your security to the cloud. Right? There's a level of control that they lose, and they don't like it. Right? So while this is doable, this is probably not the model that a lot of enterprises are going to do. Third model is you're really paranoid about security. You want to deploy a unified threat management um, system in every branch. Right? So this gives you a level of control that you didn't have with option two. However, this does get you a lot of complexities. It is more expensive to have a dedicated UTM appliance sitting in every branch, and management becomes a problem. You have two different points of management for your routing and SD-WAN, as well as for your security appliances. Lastly, you could do all of this. Right? You could deploy all of these in some form or fashion, and a lot of enterprises actually do this today. Like, There's no one single answer here. But again, this increases complexity, and this reduces control based on what you do in which branch. So we believe that we actually have an answer that might be better than all of these. The question really is, how can IT maintain choice and control when you're connecting to a cloud first and a multi-cloud kind of world? So what we are really announcing today to begin with is a full stack security embedded within our routing portfolio with SD-WAN. So we introduced SD-WAN, the WebTLA stack, in the ISR uh, iOS code base in July. And now along with that, we are embedding our core security functions, which is application-aware firewalls, IPS, IDS, URL filtering, in the SD-WAN iOS router itself. So you get a full stack solution so that you can deploy this in one place and manage it consistently from one dashboard, which is our vManage dashboard. So one place to deploy security, one place to manage it, one place to monitor it. So this is, a, uh, I think, a key innovation. All of our install base already out there has millions of ISRs. They can be enabled with SD-WAN today with a firmware upgrade. And now you can add security to it. So, so qualification here. So this, uh, if I'm running the Viptela stack on my ISR router, that's all I'm running, right? Isn't that how that goes? I turn on Viptela, and then that's my uh, my routing stack. And now I'm adding, you, you're announcing adding security to that. So that's all going to be within the, the Viptela container, if you will, running on my ISR? That's all going to be embedded in the iOS code along with the Viptela stack. Right, so the mechanism of how we embedded it depends on what functionality you're talking about. The IPS, for example, is a snort-based IPS. Okay. That's running in a container uh, for snort so that it can do all of the signature analysis and all that. But it is all natively inbuilt into the iOS image that is running SD-WAN. Okay, so it's an iOS image. Now I've just got more, Correct. more elements that you've added. You've got more this. elements okay. in addition to the SD-WAN capabilities that we announced in July. 
would it okay. be considered? But, it, but it's not a split <coughs> personality kind of a thing. Is that what you were saying? Yeah. It, it is it's a unif it, it, it is the, one image. It's, it's one, one okay. iOS image. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Is it an That's integration of FTD or just components of that or <laughs> okay. just We've we worked very closely with our security team. We have uh, the best of breed security assets and all of this is in conjunction with our security team and we've taken elements of the firewalls, the containers, the IPS, IDS, along with the threat management with Talos. So when you, when you integrate the security capabilities in an ISR, and whether you buy any of these in any form factor, whether it's an ISR or an appliance, you get the, the Talos threat detection capabilities along with this. That's one of the key differentiators we believe for our solution, where this is by far the largest threat database um, in, in the world, as and you fully, get this. As fully functional as if I were running firepower appliances? That's what yes, I'm obviously saying. there's limitations on scale. Yeah, and would that be the major difference then in the sense of why, why, why would I? Correct. So we'll talk a little bit about deployment models. Like there are clearly this is not the answer when you're running security in a campus or the head end. And you need dedicated security appliances because okay. the scale and performance matters. Okay. In a branch deployment, um, and depending on the size of the branch and the number of users, this is a clearly uh, viable solution. It reduces CapEx, it reduces management. And, and really, this is also an intersection of NetOps and SecOps, right? You also have to look at your organizational capabilities and how your SecOps team and NetOps team is going to work together to, to make this a reality. Those organization boundaries are going away, and we are seeing that going away, but it's still going to be a while before SecOps and NetOps actually talk to each other. right? So um, I'm being told that I'm going to run out of time fairly quickly, so I'm going to go through these, and we're going to double click into this uh, for the next hour and a half. So. Um, the second piece that we are announcing is integration with our umbrella stack for cloud security. So it's not just your uh, embedded branch security that we're talking about. We're also uh, adding elements from our cloud security stack, which is Cisco umbrella, and integrating that with the ISRs. So now you get a system that is fully secure wherever your users are connected in the branch or whether they are roaming around and connected through Starbucks or some other place, right, mobility. The last piece of this is the multi-cloud piece. Today, we already have solutions for cloud on-ramp where we can connect and accelerate performance to 14 SaaS applications using our cloud on-ramp, which is a shipping feature for the last year. What we are announcing is we partnered with Office 365 and we've added enhancements to that capability so that we can get you better performance by reaching to the closest O365 uh, location from where your branch is. So you don't have the performance penalty of essentially going across the world or going across the country to go to O365 location, we will make sure that you reach the nearest location to your uh, deployment. And we actually have a demo that will show you this 40% performance improvement of turning this feature on versus doing the traditional way of backhauling from your data center. Um, so in the next uh, hour or so, we'll show you a demo of this. Closest as defined by latency? Yes. There's a, well, there's a latency and jitter. There are parameters that we monitor. Okay. Yeah. So you're going to see a fairly uh, double click on this. I'm going to go over this slide very quickly. When we talk about embedded branch security, what we're talking about is enterprise firewalls. We recognize 1,400 applications. So this is application-aware firewalls. Um, we have the IPS, which I just talked about, the snot-based IPS, the most widely deployed IPS on the planet. URL filtering with 80 web categories. Um, as well as the cloud security with Umbrella. And uh, Kureli is going to talk about this in extensive detail, so I'm going to move forward. From a Cisco standpoint, we believe that we are going to give you the right security in the right place. And there's a lot of different places where you want to deploy security, starting from your data center, private cloud, SaaS, IAS. And this is just kind of giving you a quick cheat sheet on where we believe certain elements of security should be deployed. Now, whether you're talking about multi-factor authentication, which is our Duo acquisition, and we are not talking about integration with Duo today, but Duo is clearly something that you would use in mobile users and devices and things, and, uh, and that is something that needs to be done alongside the branch security and the cloud security that I'm talking about to get you a full-fledged stack. Then you have the rest of the capabilities that I am talking about today, which is firewall, PS, URL filtering, and cloud. So depending on where you are in the network, you need a pervasive security stack, and Cisco has all of the elements to give you that. And as I just mentioned, we now have a common security architecture that spans across both our uh, Viptela as well as Meraki portfolio, all of them powered by our Talos architecture. Right? So whether you're using 
a SD WAN security stack by Webtela or by Meraki, you have a common security architecture, all of it using the best of breed security assets in Cisco. This is the demo that we are actually going to show you, regardless of uh, how you are reaching to a SaaS application, specifically O365, we will provide you the fastest and best part to get there, right? And this is my last slide. I'm being asked to, to cut this because I've probably gone over time. So I guess uh, uh, we'll ask uh, the rest of our Ripteller team to step up and get into deep dive details on this. But we will talk about this one, right? Yes, we're going to talk about all of this for the next hour and a half and give you like the deep dive details on how this works. Awesome. Thank you, folks. Thank you for being here, and thank you for listening. Thank you. Yep. Aha, uh -huh. it works. Okay. Mic is on, right? All right. All right. Good morning, everybody. Morning. It's good morning. to see familiar faces here. Some of you have met uh, in person, some of you have met uh, online. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're, we're all happy to host you here. Uh, my name is David Klebanov. Uh, I'm a leader in Cisco SD WAN technical marketing organization. I came through the Viptel acquisition. Ramesh and I spent uh, many wonderful years back in Viptela. Um, so today uh, we're going to talk about a couple of topics. We're going to be double clicking, just like Ramesh and uh, Rohan mentioned in the beginning. We're going to be double clicking on several, uh, several items. Um, so there are some foundational things that I wanted to make sure that we are all sort of in agreement on. And if you have any questions, then obviously feel free to ask me anything that comes to mind. Um, iOS uh, XCSD WAN is, a, is one of those foundational things that we want to cover today because it's a foundational uh, element of uh, some of the things we, we are going to double click on later on um, in regard to uh, cloud, in regard to security. So I want to make sure that we understand uh, sort of the premise behind iOS XC SD-WAN, what is iOS XC SD-WAN, and how do you migrate to iOS XC SD-WAN uh, from what you have today, right? Um, obviously, it's a very loaded topic. Um, migration could take uh, hours just, uh, just on its own, so we won't be able to cover all of that, but at least we'll give you a flavor of the art of possible, uh, what you can do with, uh, with iOS XC SD-WAN. So that's going to be our kind of a three topics for today. First, we're going to talk about... Uh, kind of the architectural recap, because my session is kind of the first one that is generic to some degree, right? We're not going to be kind of heavily double clicking into cloud and, and security. So I'm going to spend uh, uh, maybe a couple of minutes to just setting the baseline of what uh, Cisco SD-WAN architecture is and what are the elements of Cisco SD-WAN architecture in case, you know, some of you uh, need a refresher, right? So we'll call this as a recap. Then we're going to talk about those migration best practices of how to adopt um, Cisco IOS XC SD-WAN, and uh, then I'm going to give you a brief demonstration of um, th some of the operational elements that we are uh, we're improving in our Cisco vManage platform, which is our single pane of glass for, uh, for the entire SD-WAN solution. Okay, so as an architectural kind of recap, um, we are an SDN system, so we are, we are very firm believers in uh, software-defined networking principles. Um, which identify three distinct architectural tiers of data plane, control plane, and management plane. And that's exactly how our solution is built day one. Um, on the, if you kind of follow from bottom up, on the bottom you have a collection of WAN-Edge devices. And these come in different uh, shapes and forms, physical, virtual, 
Um, we're going to have a, a slide after this one just to recap what are different platform capabilities. Uh, but these are the traditional um, V-Edge appliances, physical or virtual, that we brought into Cisco uh, from Viptela. Uh, these are also the Cisco, uh, the Cisco routing platforms, the ISR 1000, the ISR 4000, the ASR 1000, the CSR uh, virtual router. So it's a whole slew of uh, platform choices that uh, our customers have when they sort of embark on this uh, Cisco SD-WAN journey, right? Uh, we also see this um, WAN Edge as being um, critically important for the features such as multi-cloud and on-ramping into the cloud that all happens from the edge. The security features, which is pushing the security into the perimeter of the network because the closer security it is to users, the more efficient it is and the application quality of experience. So we're not going to spend time today talking about application quality of experience, but think about this as you build this entire architecture because you want to transport applications over it. So you want to make sure that the quality of experience for applications, be those on-prem applications or a cloud applications, is as best as it can be, right? So these are kind of the three key services anchored on the data plane. Now, the data plane talks to the cloud, and the cloud is a collection of controllers of different types. Uh, the first one is the vSmart controller, which is the control plane controller. Um, it's used to really establish the fabric to distribute um, control plane context around in regard to routing, security, different attributes. It runs our uh, overly management protocol, which is an extensible control plane protocol that runs over certificate authenticated TLS or DTLS connections that get established in a zero, uh, zero touch fashion between the routers and the vSmart controllers. So vSmart controllers live in the cloud. We're going to see what are the options where that cloud could be. And then at the end, you have the vManage, which is the single pane of glass. That's what you would expect from sort of a, a, a system where this is the place you go, this is your GUI, this is your uh, APIs that you can leverage uh, for any programmatic work, any scripting, anyone, of, uh, anyone who wants to kind of, you know, do things with uh, Python scripting and make REST API calls to automate some of the workflows inside uh, if you manage beyond what the graphical user interface gives you. And we have uh, kind of a growing interest uh, from the community to do kind of all of those DevOps things uh, on top of vManage. Um, so these are the three distinct layers of, uh, of the solution. Uh, in addition to that, we have the layer of analytics, which takes the telemetry from the network and uh, basically analyzes that, provides this sort of a predictive analysis as to um, capacity planning, capacity forecasting, um, some performance uh, um, baselining, things like that. We purposefully separated that from the vManage system because it requires a little bit more of that sort of a compute power and analysis rather than just vManage as being a pure operations tool when you go provision things, troubleshoot things, uh, deploy things, uh, things like that. So it's separated into a different system. It's an optional element, uh, but we have a really good uh, uh, traction around uh, customers adopting um, analytics platform. So that's kind of like a refresher for you guys to uh, keep in mind where um, what Cisco SD1 is and what are those elements of it. <coughs> now, I mentioned platforms, right? So our customers have a um, wide variety of platforms they can choose from, right? So if I go, um, again, physical platforms, the choices of either ISR platforms or the <coughs> traditional Viptela VEdge appliances, um, those are the physical platforms. So many of our customers would uh, prefer to consume this, um, this technology in the form of an appliance, a router. It's more predictable, more recognizable to the network teams. They have operational procedures around that. So they don't want to disturb that. They want to continue consuming that in a physical form factor. And for that, they have a choice of, uh, of platforms. Obviously, because we're talking about iOS XE SD-WAN, we're going to be focusing in this session on the uh, Cisco ISR and ASR platforms which actually run the iOS XE software. Um, now, for some of our customers that want to deploy this in a completely virtualized form factor, um, they're free to deploy our software on top of any x86 platform, or they can deploy this on top of our ENCS platform, which is Cisco Graybox solution. It's an x86 platform, which is also a router, has a management on it, runs a, a hypervisor, a KVM-based hypervisor, so it's kind of like a little bit friendlier than just a generic x86 server, but our customers have a choice of whether they want to run this on ENCS or just a plain vanilla any x86 server. And we reach into the public cloud 
by offering um, virtual uh, the instances of virtual routers in three major uh, cloud compute environments. So that's kind of the lay of the land as far as what is your kind of a menu of choices that um, uh, that our customers have. Now, obviously, um, many many of our customers are ISR and ASR customers. Just like uh, Rohan mentioned, millions of routers are out there. A lot of interest is how do I take those routers and move from a, a traditional routing box-by-box -box paradigm into an SD-WAN paradigm, which is a network solution, uh, which, is a, which is a system centrally managed with a cloud-based uh, control plane, all of these things, right? And for that, the iOS XE SD-WAN is really um, the driver behind it. Question? Any support for the CSR 1000V? <clears throat> yes. Uh, I'll go back a slide. This. So CSR 1000V um, is uh, formally uh, being supported in our uh, release that is going to be coming end of November. Okay. So we have a code release that is going to be end of November. We call this 1610. Um, and that is where we will support uh, CSR running iOS XE SD-WAN. Okay. Thank you very much. You have a question? Is there a functional difference between running the solution on uh, ISR platform than on a, a VH1000, for example? Excellent question. Yes, there is. <laughs> um, and that's a good segue for, um, to this slide, right? So what have we really done with the XE SD-WAN, right? So think about an XE SD-WAN as a foundational piece of software that runs on top of the Cisco iOS XE routers, ISRs 1000, 4000, ASR 1000. So what we've done is we have embedded um, a Viptela broad components, a Viptela, Viptela intelligence, Viptela services, uh, into the iOS XE SD-WAN. Now, did we keep an iOS XE SD-WAN? Sorry, uh, did we keep an iOS XE in its entirety? No, we did not. Um, many of the services that um, exist in iOS XE are not fully compatible with the way that SD-WAN operates. Um, many of the services are not uh, largely adopted. So we took this sort of like an approach of, okay, let's prune things so that we don't feel are compatible because SD-WAN is not just a router by router solution. It's a system. And as a system, it must operate as a system. So we can't just have quote unquote sort of rogue functionality that you, some of it is controlled through vManage, some of it you have to log into the router and configure CLI or use some, some other management tool. That, that does not work. It has to be controlled by vManage, right? And as, as such, we decided on which elements of a traditional iOS XE will make it into the XE SD-WAN and which ones we decide to introduce at a later point. So there is not 100% feature parity between iOS XE SD-WAN and the traditional Viptela operating system. And there is obviously some services from the traditional iOS XE that we also took out. So there are some considerations that customers go through uh, when they convert their existing routers into the iOS XE SD-WAN routers. And it's an evaluation process in regard to um, what am I gaining by getting SD-WAN features? And what am I quote unquote forfeiting by removing some of the things that we decided not to include? But as you can see in here, we kind of sprinkled that Viptela intelligence within the iOS XE SD-WAN code, right? And some of the key things that we brought from Viptela are obviously in here, and particularly the overlay management protocol is in here, um, our communication to the management system, uh, through conf, uh, conf D and uh, basically net conf communication. Obviously things that have to do with all the SD-WAN policies. And yet side by side, we kept some of the really solid proven iOS XC features in there, right? Um, as you can see, there are different buckets in here. So security is a bucket of feature functionalities embedded in iOS XE SD-WAN. We have things like services. Obviously, this is not a representative of everything inside the iOS XE SD-WAN, but just so you understand that it's kind of like taking an iOS XE SD-WAN, sprinkling those Viptela components in them embedded, so it's not running as an external foreign entity as a container or whatnot. It's embedded inside the iOS XE image. You mentioned that there's some features that from uh, the, 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 the traditional Vitella, Vitella platform that wouldn't make it in. So you, you mentioned that. Right. And you didn't specify. I'm curious <laughs> to know, but maybe this isn't the right time. Right. Is there anything in the uh, what we would be familiar with in the iOS XE code that is now gone when you would uh, upgrade to the... Right. So um, you had two questions. Uh, the yeah. first one is... Uh, uh, the first one is, um, what do you lose uh, from the traditional Viptela? Um, so 15 months into acquisition, 
um, obviously it's a very tremendous amount of work that goes into introducing the traditional Viptela features that we had developed for years into the iOS XE SD1 uh, code, right? So it takes time. Yeah. So um, there's a certain roadmap of when the features that um, existed on Viptela, uh, we have 75% uh, of them already in XE SD1. There's a certain amount of features that are still trickling in into the iOS XE SD1. Um, you will have a complete full parity between what you had before and what you have after. Yeah. Um, so that's just a matter of uh, short time. Okay. Um, the second question about what features of iOS, um, uh, iOS XE traditional one you lose, quote unquote, by um, uh, converting that to an iOS XE SD1. So there's some things, for example, the, oh, the, the whole slew of IPVPN technologies that, uh, that exist in traditional iOS XE, such as DMVPN, for example. Not there anymore. Hmm. We have our own mechanisms. Okay. Right? Um, so things like that, right? Um, and some of the things that um, did not make it to the XESD1 initially are going to be introduced into the XESD1. Again, it's a matter of, it's, it's a factor of time. Yeah. Some of the customers are using the ISR, especially in the assembly market for yep. routing, UC, et cetera, yes. et cetera. Is UC going to be part of, the, of that code as well? Or Absolutely. Um, it is not there today. Um, we have, um, I'll talk to you about when we talk about the migration. Um, uh, today, if you were to look at the uh, iOS XE SD1, it does not have those traditional um, voice features such as, you know, SRST functionality, um, you know, PRI termination for local uh, voice breakouts at the branch offices. Uh, we see a tremendous move, uh, for, for specifically for UC, uh, we see a tremendous move into uh, SIP-based communications, in which case it's all basically just network. Right? And building a better network gives you a better, you know, unified communication experience. As long as, and we have many customers who are kind of departing from the traditional way of thinking about, I have to do PRI circuits, FXO, FXS circuits. I have to make sure that I have SRST because my WAN can go down. But building a solid WAN, many of those things just disappear on its own because now I have a fully redundant WAN that never goes down, right? I don't need an SRST functionality in it, right? Do I need an, a, a PRI breakout? Well, no, I'm moving into SIP-based trunking, right? So many of those voice-specific things are actually not needed in the world of you know, 2018. Sort of true. Right? Sort of true. Because you leave some customers in a pickle because there's school districts and hospitals and stuff that need a tremendous right. amount of analog backup. So you can't just move away and say, well, for sure. I agree with you as far as what you're saying, the spirit yeah. of what you're saying. Right. And it's a fair point, yeah. right? So keep in mind, it's a matter of time until the things that um, that are not there today are going to make it into iOS XCSD1. For that, we have our, you know, our mm -hmm. customers, our yeah. management team that works diligently on making sure that these things make it back. Yeah. Again, 15 months into acquisition, we've done a lot. A uh, uh, somewhat related question. Uh, in a few of the other sessions that we've had, we've uh, around surrounding SD WAN, um, we've been wondering about uh, multicast as, yes. as a feature. Is is that going to be included with this? Yes. So multicast is um, is a long-standing feature that we had from Viptela days. Mm -hmm. um, multicast again, it's one of those features that is not there today on XE SD WAN. Um, so and again, just like I mentioned about voice, it's going to make its way into the um, into the XE SD1. Obviously, the traditional XE has a very solid uh, implementation of multicast. It's just a matter of making sure that that is brought into the SD1 domain under the vManage management, vSmart controllers. So it's a matter of time. Absolutely, our plans are to have multicast as part of the iOS XE SD1. Um, so, good questions. Um, let me uh, move a little bit further around uh, migration sequences. So um, the customers who are adopting iOS XE SD1 have to plan how to get on board XE SD1, right? Uh, some of those are easy. Um, some of those require a little bit more kind of a, you know, considerations, right? So we typically see um, that adoption having three phases. The first one is obviously establishing the controller footprint. This is 95% uh, of our customers opt for cloud controllers. We have a fully automated cloud ops operation that spins up all this control infrastructure in our public cloud backend. So that's not, sus that's not something 95% of our customers ever have to get involved with beyond placing an order. You place an order, magic happens, controllers are spun up. So nobody needs to do anything about that. What the customers really focus on is transitioning data centers and more importantly, introducing SD-WAN into, into an existing data centers, and then performing the actual migration on the branches. That's primarily where the bulk of the sort of the work goes into. 
right? Obviously, everything is zero touch, but there are some certain considerations that you keep in mind. So if we look at controllers, uh, controller deployment, as I said, fully automated um, when it's deployed inside Cisco Cloud by the Cisco Cloud Ops team. Um, customers have a choice to deploy this in their own data centers, a small subset of our customers that have some compliance um, or regulations that require them to host their own control infrastructure. They absolutely do that in their own data centers, works equally the same. And we have an opportunity for our partners to deploy and host and manage those controllers in their own clouds. So their own data centers, their own call of facilities and whatnot. So we have a slew of partners that basically see that as an opportunity for them to uh, provide value added services into the customers. Whatever the case may be, those are all virtual elements. They can live in any IP cloud, customer cloud, Cisco cloud, partner cloud. Now, <laughs> if we talk about data center, um, Data center deployment usually revolves around um, topology that looks like this, when an SD-WAN intelligence, and in this case, we're talking about iOS XE SD-WAN, but it equally applies to the traditional uh, Viptela operating system and traditional Viptela uh, routers as well. So we're making kind of an emphasis on iOS XE SD-WAN here, but um, equally applies to the VH, uh, VH routers and the Viptela operating system as well. Um, these routers are inserted in a manner that is sort of like sandwiched in between the data center core and the front facing layer of MPLS, um, which is the MPLS CE routers and the firewalls that front end the internet connectivity that already exists in the data center today before you even started SD-WAN adoption, right? So it's kind of a typical topology of the data center. There are certain advantages of why that's a typical architecture. Uh, we're going to double click on some of them later, so I don't want to linger too much, but data centers are usually very straightforward. It requires, obviously, very comprehensive support for routing protocols, which we have, uh, because um, unlike branches that tend to be simpler, data centers tend to, tend to be more complicated. Um, so obviously, you have to make sure uh, full support for routing protocols, OSPF, BGP. Um, before somebody asked about EIGRP, yes, we're adding EIGRP. Um, but today, it's OSPF and BGP. Um, and uh, obviously the interaction between the core switches, the MPLS CE routers, so it's all kind of embedded into the data center uh, routing topology. So you are talking about, David, uh, OSPF and BGP as an underlay because as an overlay you that have OMP, right? Absolutely, yes, um, absolutely right. Um, overlay cannot live without underlay connectivity. I need to have a foundational IP connectivity before I can establish any tunnels, any control connections. So absolutely right. For the migration scenarios, EIGRP for the underlay would be necessary. Um, very fair point. Uh, very well taken. Yes, EIGRP is out there um, a lot. Um, so we will be adding that. Um, in the meantime, there's ways to do redistribution between OSPF and EIGRP on the core switches. So there are, there are ways around that. Matter of time, EIGRP will be there. Um, if we look at uh, branches, right? So let me run through like, a couple of quick scenarios about branches. So a branch that looks like this, it's a simple branch that has a single router, no redundancy, connected to an MPLS circuit, has potentially maybe a LAN switch that is doing layer three, again, OSPF, BGP, or it's just a layer two connected subnet, really simple, maybe some layer two switches sprinkled around. Um, what we do in that case, and the simplest one is to perform a software upgrade. Again, it's a compatible platform. So it's one of those platforms that a customer already has in their, um, in their branch. They just do a simple software upgrade. Load the software, reboot the box, comes back up. All the control plane stack comes online, which means talks OMP to the controllers, talks netconf to the vManage system for management, interfaces with the southbound routing, if there is any, right? performs potentially redistribution between OSPF, BGP into OMP to advertise that out into the rest of the overlay. So this entire sort of control and management stack just comes online, zero touch, right? So the amount of effort that went into this is performing a software upgrade, right? Again, it's an opportunity to also diversify the connectivity. So if there was an MPLS circuit, keep it. If you want to augment an, an MPLS with internet, add an internet, some of our customers add 4G LTE, some of our customers discontinue MPLS circuits uh, in some sites. So it's a complete sort of freedom of choice as far as which transport um, is chosen. Will you continue to keep OMP or 
for the overlay are you considering to Oh, very good question. Would we consider to have an OMP uh, or continue with OMP? Absolutely. OMP is the coolest thing we have. <laughs> it's a really foundational uh, protocol within the, within the SD-WAN fabric. Um, it's, it's far superior to any other control plane mechanisms that we've seen out there. What about interop then? Interop. We can talk about that. Okay. <laughs> interop, the way we see that, um, um, is happening on the southbound. The fabric itself, the core of the fabric, is, has, has to be compatible with, um, with our sort of control plane. Right? Well, it's a good point. Potentially, you know, opens a good opportunity. Actually, one of the first days at Viptela, I actually asked why is there not an RFC for OMP. So, um, it's a good opportunity to have one. Um, the next one is very similar, and we're talking about redundancy in this case. So a side that looks like this, which basically has two routers, right? And one router is connected to MPLS network. The other one is providing some backup connectivity through some sort of an IP VPN technology. Could be any flavor of VPN technology, um, you know, DMVPN, GetVPN, whatever, VPN, XVPN uh, technology that customers deploy. Very, um, very popular design of active standby approach active MPLS, everything goes to MPLS, backup is IPVPN, some sort of a first hop routing protocol in here, um, HSRP, VRRP, whatever the choice uh, is, or potentially layer three switch with OSPF and BGP. But pretty straightforward. Uh, the migration into XESDN is as simple as the um, case before, is that both routers upgraded. Obviously, there is a way to do this one by one, um, I, my personal recommendation is to make it simple, the simpler the better, take a downtime on that site, schedule a maintenance, upgrade both routers, let the control and management stack come online, have that site fully migrated into SD-WAN. We're going to talk in a few minutes what happens to backwards connectivity to a non-SD-WAN site, but leave that for a second. The actual site itself, software upgrade in both boxes, and again, first of routing protocol, uh, VRRP today, and OSPF BGP, nothing really changes, right? It's the same, same philosophy that you had before, just now under the control and management plane of SD-1. So I'm going to be very transparent with you with this question. Upgrading code on production routers, especially you know big chassis switches and that sort of thing, scares me. Sure. Not because it's not necessary, but because it doesn't work all the time, and you know it's two o'clock in the morning in a data center. I sure. hate doing. It. I do it. But I hate doing. It. <laughs> Are you seeing a lot of just great success with upgrading the code to the uh, um, iOS XESD WAN code and no, no significant issue? Um, well, so I, I share your concerns. <laughs> I, I was a network engineer uh, many years ago. Uh, uh, is but it production today? Is it a simple? Oh, okay. So the upgrade, the before... Well, that's a good question. Is, yeah. yeah, so the, the upgrade process itself is not dissimilar from a traditional router upgrade because this is the before is no SD-WAN present yet. So I have to use my existing tools however I upgrade my routers. Does that you know, bring in USB stick and plugging it to the USB port, copying the file into boot flash, changing boot parameters and rebooting? Maybe I want to do TFTP and upload this to the boot flash, reboot. So however I do this today, the before is however people do this today. Once it's upgraded, then the control and management stack kicks in, and then I have vManage to do any subsequent upgrades within the SD-WAN. Now, I agree to your point. Um, the only thing I can say is that there's an operational discipline, um, you know, file the change control, doesn't work, roll back. Right, so there's uh, there's very little to be said about that. It's a software upgrade, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> with all these sort of you know things that come with it. It's, it's if it's successful, and I. Very, I'm very confident that it will be successful, but if something goes wrong, you're all back. That's what you have the maintenance windows for, right? So very, there are design scenarios, which unfortunately we don't have time to talk about, that um, are more complicated and actually um, run the SD-WAN and non-SD-WAN intelligence at the same time, so you can be sort of like both, uh, um, you know, both worlds, and you can say, is it, is, was that successful? Was it not successful? I still have connectivity. Uh, if it's not successful, um, so maybe shortens the maintenance window, less interruption. Um, we have those designs, and we'd love to engage with individuals that want to learn about those designs. Obviously, they're a little bit more complicated, require more 
um, skills around routing and interoperability between overlay and underlay. So it tends to be more complicated, doable, but tends to be more complicated. Are you explaining you release um, a migration uh, guide where clients use the I1 with CRJP and the NVPN wants to move to that because that's going to be... Good question. Yes. Um, there's a slew of Cisco validated designs we're working on. Um, <laughs> it's a work in progress. Um, specifically for a software upgrade, we already have um, a lot of resources. There's a, there's a document that describes how the migration occurs. Not a migration from a system like iWend into a system like Cisco SD-WAN, but more like how do you perform an upgrade. There's video recordings about this. So for that specific piece of a software upgrade, um, we have that out there in our documentation and YouTube channel. Um, but as a system migration from this to this, I'm going to touch on that in slide or two. Uh, but CVD is a work in progress to exactly accommodate all of those um, scenarios. Migration tool. Yes, this is a good uh, thing, Ramesh. Yes. So for configuration migration, we have a tool that basically um, you input your existing configuration from the copy paste, your existing configuration from the router. Um, it's, um, then you can link it into your vManage instance. It basically analyzes the configuration, says which, which lines of config are not compatible with SD-WAN. It's going to flag those and it's going to ask you to remove those. Um, and then after everything checks out from the config, it will actually reach out through API calls into the vManage and create all the configs inside vManage. So there's a config tool that helps with that transition. You said that we have to copy paste. Yes. Uh, there is no way for the tool to connect directly to the router and, Not today. and check the configuration. Yeah, today it's a, it's a very fair point working on it. Um, but uh, today but there's no... It's the day of automation and... and right. Kind of so the, the thing is with traditional router, um, you, has, you, you either have to SSH to it and then you know, suck the config and analyze it. So it's, it's possible. But today that config tool is taking a little bit more of that sort of manual approach. But you as an administrator. It's a direction that you will. Absolutely, like. yes. Yeah, the idea is to explore the direction of quote unquote, like sucking the config out yeah. of the existing router, uh, running through the logic, analyzing, spitting out vManage templates. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> in some of the cases, um, we have routers that are either a managed router, um, which is this gray out guy. Um, actually, it's this to begin with, right? It's a managed router. Um, you can't really upgrade that uh, because it's managed by a service provider. And uh, they may not offer Cisco SD-WAN as a service, and, but you still want Cisco SD-WAN as a service. So you keep the managed router and you build SD-WAN on top of that, right? That's one option. The second, there could be some unsupported feature that would prevent you from upgrading this router such as voice, for example, today. Um, or there could be things like underlay backup, which is kind of an advanced topic. So what you do, you basically um, don't touch that router. You add a router. It's an additional box that you add into the site to keep what you have today. And you add an additional iOS XE SD-WAN box into it. And that box will build an SD-WAN fabric on top of that. It's a very corner case, a um, couple of ifs. And if those ifs exist, then you have no choice. And that your solution is to add an SD-WAN intelligence side by side to your existing router intelligence. Not my first choice, but if you have to do it, potentially. That's, that's, the that's Ethan. a transition strategy though. You it is. up the SD-WAN fabric and you slowly start moving exactly. the graphic over. You can do that, yes. Yeah. But I, I share your facial expression that it's not the best. But well, when you have to, then you have scenarios to. scenarios where that's really what you're going to need to do because sure. of reasons, yeah. Sure. yeah. Uh, I'm not going to touch on that, but uh, virtual branch, I t touched on that in the beginning, fully supported ENCS or any x86 box, just load the VNFs on it. You can do Cisco uh, plug and play to bring it up in an automated fashion. Um, so e in case it's ENCS, right? Uh, ENCS and the SD1 VNFs on it. Potentially you can add additional VNFs, such as web optimization VNF, firewall VNF, whatever VNF you want to add that, it's a virtual branch solution. Um, as far as the interoperability is concerned, uh, we really see data centers is the most optimal way to perform that, uh, that interoperability. Um, and that basically boils down to routing. You advertise the SD-WAN subnets into the underlay. You advertise the underlay subnets into SD-WAN. You perform the redistribution uh, of the two in the hub site, which is the data center. And a data center is kind of built like this. 
data center core, MPLS CE routers facing the MPLS, oops, apologies, SD-WAN routers, SD-WAN head-ends facing the SD-WAN fabric. So we tend to look at that as a transition hubs. Many times these transition hubs are data centers and um, that's where the overlay and underlay meet. There are designs where overlay and underlay can meet at every single branch. So I have sing every single branch that can do overlay and underlay to an MPLS site. Not something that we advocate. We've seen a fair share of issues with that, starting from the routing, routing loops, uh, every branch office becoming a transit site because you didn't filter the routes properly, turns into an ECMP problem. How do I reach that other site? Oh, it's 100 branch offices that can take me there, which is not true. Um, so a whole slew of things that could happen. So we really see those data, center, um, data centers and those hubs to be sort of the anchor point. Now, so how, how are you handling this? Is the hub, is it just routing? Uh, it's just routing. Okay, so there's no magic tools or anything that's going to make this easier for me. It's, a, it's just more like a Cisco validated design. Right. Hey, set up your routing like this to solve these problems. Yes, exactly. Like uh, when you had PMU, PMU, TIJ, the stub feature hmm. or OSPF, multi-metric route real estate. So, yeah. yeah, it's basically two worlds meeting at the data center core, right? Now, for those customers who are a little bit more geographically distributed and are saying, I like this approach, I like the way that you are kind of safeguarding me from you know, shooting myself in the foot, <coughs> but I'm very distributed, and you're asking me about data center. Can I use multiple data centers? Of course. So we have some customers that have done this in a distributed fashion. When they have geographically distributed data centers, so Americas, Europe, Asia, and again, routing tricks to make sure that we attract the traffic from a specific region into the local hub symmetrically from both SD-WAN and the MPLS, right? Again, it's a little bit kind of a more uh, involved design, but comes down to just basically routing interaction between an overlay and underlay. So that ca those capabilities around routing protocols and the mature routing protocol support, field proven support, um, that's, it's critical in this case. Do you like prefer this pet over this pet than uh, I think uh, we manage arranging the higher OMP preference or user uh, needs to know that uh, <coughs> higher prefer higher number with the OMP is the be uh, best pet? Which right, so um, it's uh, when you are in SD1 world, you operate by the SD1 rules which is exactly the OMP preference. And really this one says to draw the traffic that I'm trying to keep this within the region. I have this hub, uh, which could be the European hub, and I'm trying to stay within Europe, right? I'm trying to say SD1 region in Europe and SD1 uh, or an MPLS region in Europe. I want them to stay within Europe, right? And that's exactly what it's doing is that it's setting the higher preference for the subnets in the MPLS region yeah. down and that's actually my question. Uh, so uh, do I need to set the higher preference or can I just say a fraction uh, <coughs> that traffic should stay, let's say, on Sure. Um, so it's a good point. Um, today within the tool, um, it's down to the administrator to actually set the proper configurations and policies to make sure that it happens. Um, there is no tool that we offer that does this magically for you, there's potentially an opportunity for somebody to write an API calls um, that would, uh, that would you know, execute on a logic like that. It's nothing more than a logic between templates and configuration, um, uh, configuration templates and policies to make sure that you execute on this. There's no voodoo magic in here. It's very straightforward networking, right? So if you're a network engineer, you understand how routing works, you could execute on that. Okay, so um, I do have it, um, I'll skip on that one. But I do have a demonstration uh, to show you. Uh, maybe I will take one minute to show you this. Um, from the configuration standpoint. Can we see an upgrade? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody will be. You can, um, if, okay. you have a, if you have a 15 minutes not to do anything, but yes. We actually have a videos uh, out there um, that um, outline the whole upgrade process. It has a lot of hits. Uh, Hamza is uh, one of the one of the presenters in that in that video. Him and uh, Nikolai uh, they teamed up uh, on that. There's a video on YouTube. You can watch it, 45 minutes, I believe. 
30 minutes, yes. Um, and uh, it walks you through prerequisites, configuration uh, tool, and the actual upgrade itself. Not really fun. The actual upgrade itself is really nothing but loading an image, rebooting, and waiting. Yeah. Everything else, once, the, once, once it's SD-WAN device, logic kicks in, it's governed by the SD-WAN rules. Everything is centrally managed through vManage. Uh, so one thing I wanted to quickly show you is uh, okay. So this is the this is the vManage, right? If you haven't seen one, this is the management tool, right? So one cool thing that we're doing is uh, many of, many of our customers are kind of a simple customers, so they don't look for a lot of complicated way of doing things, right? Um, so we said, okay, how can we simplify life for the easy deployments, right? I just want to spin up a couple of, or maybe a lot of sites, but they're really simple. I'm not looking for anything extra elaborate or things like that, right? If I want to do those like crazy things like regional hubs and things like that, obviously I need to be a little bit more involved. Uh, but if I'm just trying to spin up something simple, so how can I do that? So we have a really simple thing in here that we call a network design. So when I log into this, I can create, uh, basically, this tool allows me to visualize my configuration of the, um, of the network. So clouds are my transports. And then I can go into the managed network. I can say, I want to add a branch. And I can say, this is redundant branch. And I can say, this is my private router profile, and I can say what type of the router that is, and these are all the routers we talked about, and I would say which circuit it's connected to, so this is going to be connected to MPLS, great, I want to add another profile, and I want to call it a public router profile, I will choose the same, uh, the same, type, of, uh, uh, the same type of router, there it is, and say this guy connects to the public network, and obviously I messed it up. Okay, <laughs> but I would have, um, if I would have saved that, basically what I'm doing in here, I'm creating um, this uh, flow of templates, or sort of the configuration of the templates, but instead of me sort of going and defining things uh, in more detailed way, I just have this really simple flow of defining what the router is, which VPNs are in there, which interfaces are in there, and it's all kind of a wizard driven, next, 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 at the end it saves it, and you can apply this configuration onto the, uh, onto the routers, right? So one of the operational enhancements that we're doing within the vManage um, that really streamlines the simpler deployments. Okay, I'm getting the, the sign. Can, can you do all of this programmatically? Absolutely, excellent question. Everything you see on this GUI can be invoked through REST API calls, anything. So we have some customers that have an appetite for doing that. Absolutely, you can automate anything that is beyond what you see in here. You don't like the way we do it. You want to do it your own. You have your own GUI. You have your own operation portal that you have for your ops team. Be my guest. Have a, another website with you know, Python scripting and API calls. Is your GUI an API consumer? Absolutely. Um, the API, everything we do in the GUI is basically the same API calls that you can make to, uh, to the vManage server. All right, so I hope this was uh, informative, yet fast. So I'll, uh, I'll let uh, Hamza take you through the next topic. Mike's working. Yes. All right, uh, good morning everyone. My name is Hamza Kardami. Uh, I'm a technical marketing engineer with the Cisco SD-WAN group. Uh, I've been with Cisco for close to eight years, uh, working <coughs> on different technologies like security, VPNs, PKI, 
uh, and now I'm uh, focused on our new SD-WAN product. So today we're going to be talking about cloud on-ramp for SaaS, specifically focusing on Office 365 and the kind of uh, you know innovation that we've brought to the market with a new product. So let's take a step back and kind of see what's happening in the market today, right? We're looking at SaaS adoption overall, and this is on the rise. All of us know this. Now, to address this, however, we have a couple of impediments, some blockers along the way. When we talk to our customers, what we notice is two things always stand out. One is performance. So what they say is, hey, I want to adopt SaaS, but today my WAN architecture tells me that I have to send my you know, data traffic all the way out to a data center and then break out to the internet to consume that SaaS application. That's a problem because that's not very optimal for the application itself. Then the number one blocker that we see is always network security. So when we talk about security, what we say is, if I allow my user, the branch, to access the SaaS application directly, I'm going to be sacrificing on security and visibility. Uh, I may lose the ability to understand what's happening at what particular branch. I have to you know, tackle problems with routing. I may start attracting uh, unnecessary traffic into my device by doing this sort of routing. So I want to avoid those challenges. And you know, these were kind of the problems that we wanted to address with Cloud, cloud On-Ramp itself. So again, taking a look at traditional cloud adoption, as Office 365 and Salesforce adoption has gone up, we're still looking at this type of an architecture today. We have users at a branch who will be using legacy WAN or MPLS to go all the way to the data center. Now at the data center, you have your central firewall that's doing your scrubbing, inspection. You have a, you know, NMS tools that are doing monitoring for you to get visibility into traffic flows and things like that. And then you break out to the internet and then finally get to the SaaS. So the biggest problem with this is when we talk to SaaS vendors like O365, they tell us the biggest impediment to SaaS adoption is the network. This design is what causes performance issues for them. So instead of um, you know, looking at it from a perspective of SaaS, they have one of the largest backbone networks in the world. They are already optimizing access to their application within their particular tenants, within their data centers. However, it is this last mile connectivity that becomes a problem from an optimization perspective to deliver the best user experience for applications in O365, for example. So this is kind of what we want to address. So that's where Cloud On-Ramp for SaaS comes in. And this slide was kind of to talk about you know, the, the building principles of the solution itself. So the first thing was that this feature is going to be a part of SD-WAN itself. So the idea is when you use SD-WAN, you're going to have multiple circuits. You may have your existing MPLS, and you're augmenting that with cheap broadband. You may even you know, let go of MPLS altogether. In that, case, in that case, you have multiple ISPs at a particular branch location. So we wanted a solution that can leverage those ISPs and provide you a direct path to the cloud itself. The next element of this was measured performance. So the idea was that however many number of circuits I have, whatever the nature of circuits may be, could be broadband, MPLS, LTE, et cetera, I should be able to measure metrics from a performance perspective to the end SaaS application. I should be able to measure loss and latency across all my circuits. I should be able to get those metrics on a per application level to make educated decisions. So what educated decisions am I talking about? That's where the network intelligence piece comes in. So here we're saying that based on those parameters of loss and latency, my network and my system should be able to intelligently reroute traffic in the case that there's any problem in the network. So all of this should be done without any user intervention coming to play. And of course, then we talk about security. So if I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to make a solution where I'm going to do direct internet access at a branch, how do I make sure that uh, I don't compromise on security? Uh, and my colleague Kureli will be covering a lot more on the security front. But think of it like our solution, what we will be doing from a security front, is to make sure that you have the power to say that only a trusted enterprise SaaS application is allowed to break out to the internet. And only traffic that's returning for that SaaS application is allowed back in. You don't have to do any complex routing. You don't have to just send anything and everything out to the internet using DIA. So you have the power of policy to control that. And not only that, you can even make decisions via policy to say that I want this to occur to a very specific application at a particular branch for a particular VRF or a VPN. And uh, finally, the foundational factor of the entire architecture itself is simplicity. So we want to make sure that all of this is achievable via a few click, you know, buttons on the GUI itself.
So let's talk about the first, um, you know, one common use case that you'd come across with this particular solution. Here we talk about a dual DIA. So what we're saying is we have uh, a particular Vantage device, so you have a branch, you have two internet circuits connected over here, and we want to understand, okay, can I leverage both of these circuits? So I'm going to be using Cloud Express or Cloud on for SaaS to write a policy automatically through vManage to say that let's use both of these circuits and enable breakout for a particular application, in our case, Office 365, directly over those circuits. So when we do this, the first thing we do is DNS probing. Now, what we've done is we've partnered with Microsoft and we've come up with a custom probing endpoint. The idea with this custom probing endpoint is when you onboard Office 365 as an application for Cloud X, for Cloud on for SaaS on the WAN Edge, automatically this device starts probing that custom endpoint across all available transports. The idea with this custom probing endpoint is when we, when we are returned a DNS response, these happen to be Anycast IP addresses. Now what Microsoft has promised us is that regardless of wherever you are in the world, whatever, wherever your branch may be located and whatever circuit it may be, we will give you IP addresses that are reachable as quickly as possible from your particular site. So when we do this probing from the WAN edge, we are being returned IP addresses which we will eventually reach out to as quickly as possible from each individual circuit. And that's the reason why we end up doing DNS probing on every path available there. What we've also seen in the field is that sometimes you may end up you may end up seeing that it's possible to get return the same IP address across multiple circuits. However, the difference happens to be in terms of latency and number of hops. So what we notice is that sometimes we have some ISPs who have tie-ups with O365. So they have, uh, you know, you may see one ISP takes maybe 10 hops to get to a particular service front of O365 versus ISP2 takes maybe 15. So the idea is for this solution to first determine what the closest front door is per ISP, and then sprinkle in some intelligence on top of that to make sure that we are reaching that front door in the best path possible. Best path possible. So once we've been, uh, once we've you know resolved DNS and we've understood, okay, over ISP one, this one over here is the closest service front door for 0365, and over ISP two, it may be another one over there. We start doing layer seven probes. So these aren't just layer three, layer four pings. We are doing la layer seven HTTP probes. That means we're sending HTTP probes all the way up to those particular service front doors. And again, when talking with Microsoft, what they have told us is that as long as you can make sure that your application or client simulated flows can reach to me at that particular service front door, it's my duty as in Microsoft's duty to make sure that everything within that particular data center and that tenant is accelerated. So rather than you trying to go to a front door that's closest to you based on your knowledge, it's better that you go to a front door that they advertise as being closest to you. And once you get there, they will make sure to get you to the end application, whatever it may be, as soon as possible. And they guarantee even faster connectivity than a normal WAN. So the idea is once we get those IP addresses and we start simulating these flows, we start collecting performance metrics over each transport. So we're collecting loss and latency and we're compiling the data and we're sending it over to vManage. Once we get this data, now we have some kind of insight into the health of each ISP. So in this case, let's say we determine that ISP2 is not doing so well. Maybe it has high latency, maybe it has some amount of loss that's beyond a threshold. In that case, now when we have a user who wants to you know, open up a session for Office 365, uh, they send, the first thing they do is they're gonna generate a DNS query. That DNS query will come into my managed router and now my managed router already has been proactively probing O365's front doors and determining the best path. So it knows that at this point in time, ISP1 is the best way to get to O365. So it's gonna make sure that this DNS query is intercepted and redirected over ISP1 to make sure it also is resolved to that front door just like it was done for the Vantage router itself. And once we have that uh, IP address, that uh, DNS response is sent back to the user. So now the user will start the actual O365 session. And once that O365 session comes through the Vantage router, we'll automatically learn it, build a forwarding cache table entry. So that's where DPI kicks in, understands this is O365, and it begins routing it over that best path as well. Do you really see that when the user does that DNS query, they might get a different response back than uh, the probe doing it? Uh, no, because 
actually yes because what happens is from a user perspective they could have any dns setting on their machine so it's possible that if you go to 888 you may get uh, return an ip address that's different when i go to something else that's the reason why when when we develop the solution we make sure to intercept the dns query yeah. and send it to the same dns server that we're using so this is this is specific to office 365 And this you, behavior is uh, meaning the DNS resolution piece of it, or? Well, yeah, it, you said you worked with Microsoft to to set this up. Is yeah, the custom probing endpoint. Yes, that's specific to O three six five. Yeah. Okay, so, Salesforce was up there on another screen, though. So there's integration with other SaaS providers. Uh, yes, we are working with other SaaS providers, like uh, David had mentioned. We have a little over a dozen uh, SaaS applications out there. The reason we haven't onboarded too many more is because. it depends how you access that saas application some vendors out there what happens is um, you know when we talk about an application there are tons of flows that get created you have a database you have you know images located somewhere else some email somewhere else video somewhere else they don't have an uh, a concept of centralized architecture they don't have a concept of a common service front door they kind of put it all over the place so if we start probing one thing you know maybe a part of your application will work fine another part of it may not with the good thing about ote 65 is they've kind of made these uh, front doors globally available across the world one of the largest networks we've seen and what they do is and what or rather what they say is don't try and optimize you know per sub application in ote 65 because when you open up skype that's you know tied into outlook that's tied out to other applications like onedrive and things like that all they say is just come to my service front door as quickly as you can don't worry about anything beyond that i'll make it i'll make sure to get you to the end <laughs> application as quickly as possible So that's kind of what we ended up doing here. Yeah, what you're saying is, sounds like maybe an evolution from what I'd last heard on the topic of what Microsoft does, because I'd understood it as when you do the DNS lookup, it uh, geolocates based on the resolver. Yes, and then that it moves data closer to that point. Yes, that was uh, that's how it is even today in some places. But the point of us getting this custom probe endpoint was to go go away from that approach. And they may move things around, so some applications may cache and some may do something else. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So another very 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 common use case that we see in the field is doing a DIA as well as a gateway site. So what we mean over here is, let's say you have a managed router, you already had MPLS, you've used that MPLS to build as DVAN with the, another managed located elsewhere. to augment uh, as demand you've purchased a cheap broadband circuit that's ifp1 over there but you also know that there are other wireless devices that could potentially act as gateway sites in this entire deployment that wireless gateway could be a colu facility where you've purchased you know services like express route direct connect or even just a regional hub where you have this big fat mpls pipe uh, you know that or rather internet pipe that has a high bandwidth low latency so the idea is if you can identify sites like these Uh, the solution can be made intelligent enough to do probing not only for the local circuit itself but also you can designate that for these particular sites i'd like to use potentially another site like a colu facility to act as a gateway and automatically when you onboard an application into cloud on ramp for saas it will begin doing the same dns probing uh, you know discovery of applications across its particular links at both sites so in doing so maybe my branch over here is located somewhere in australia and i'm getting resolved to a front door here whereas this uh, gateway is maybe located somewhere in singapore closer to another data center there and that's being resolved over an isp2 to a to a to a particular for service front door over there so in that case we're being resolved to two different front doors and now the manage has intelligence to begin uh, doing those probes across both those circuits so now the cool thing about this solution is We understand that over here we have a direct connectivity to the application <laughs> itself. So that means our probe, you know, exits out directly from the branch into that O three six five service front door. Versus over here, it's riding the SD WAN fabric to reach the managed gateway site, and then the managed gateway site itself is doing the probing. So what happens is the managed intelligently understands that there is this SD WAN fabric in between. So what it does is it it creates a composite metric. So it says, okay, uh, I'm going to add in loss latency parameters that I've already, you know, that I'm already doing probing for on the SD WAN fabric, and I'm going to add that intelligently to the loss and latency parameters that the probing at the managed gateway is doing. So we create a composite metric to understand is the path that I can break out from directly at the managed better than me going through the SD WAN fabric through this gateway site or not, and then based on that we start making a routing decision. 
So this becomes pretty powerful because you may end up in scenarios where you know one particular ISP is not working that well. So in this case here, my local ISP had a brownout. Uh, there's a problem with the application access. So now I still have the intelligence in the system so that when that DNS query that was sent out initially, it has already been resolved via ISP2. I will be able to send my traffic through the SD-WAN fabric into that gateway site and then break out from that gateway site into the O365 front door that's accessible from that colo location. And that's applicable to CASB as well? I'm sorry? That's applicable to CASB as well, clients using? Yes, you could, yes, you could use that with CASB as well. Yeah. Uh, some other SD-WAN vendors have the concept of like the cloud gateway or the POP that you connect to locally, regionally. Mm -hmm. Is there anything like that? Because I see Branch Edge and then Office 360. Yes, for us, it's more of a uh, deployment model. The idea is that if you have an idea to have a facility like this, a colo location somewhere where you want to get in these you know, better circuits, express routes, the idea is to drop a Vantage router over there. As, as long as it has IP connectivity, which is what you'll get with those DC and express routes, you will build your SD-WAN fabric over them. So the point is from the solution perspective, you can say that I know, you know I have these particular colo facilities at uh, you know, Singapore, North America, and maybe Australia. I'll designate, designate those as my gateway sites for particular applications. So the solution will automatically understand to do probing from those facilities. Mm -hmm. so, but we don't do something where we advocate going out and just creating something like that. Uh, it's a matter of whether you want to get that service at that high you know, IP connectivity at a particular location or not. And if you do, you just drop a manage router there and build the SD-WAN fabric to it. Okay. Yeah, so if I may add, the, the gateway-based uh, model um, can be an assist to the DIA model. That's kind of how we have seen customers uh, take this. The uh, reason for that is probably about like 80, 90% of the time, your internet access directly from the branch, if it's connected to a tier one ISP, will give you the most optimal way to get into Microsoft. So there's no real need for a gateway to do anything there. Uh, but there might be cases, back to what Hamza was mentioning, where I need to go to an intermediate point like a colo, uh, because my direct internet exp access path is just experiencing like higher latency, jitter, and, and so forth. So I may take a, a, a U-turn through a gateway. Yes. Uh, the gateway-based model essentially has a has an issue that you're bound by the scale of the gateway. The scale of the gateway yep. here being like how many gateways do I have really dictates performance. Yep. Uh, and it, it's really hard if it's a really large geographically distributed enterprise to place the gateway so you get optimal performance for, for everything. For SaaS applications in particular, we have seen Internet DIA be the prominent methodology. What we offer is across DIA and the gateway path, you actually have a fallback. So if my DIA path fails, then I can I actually go through a, through a gateway. So we don't force the gateway conversation on customers, but it can be used as an assist on top of, uh, mm -hmm. on top of DIA. Thanks, Amesh. Why all these things are done by you? Why not? Uh, Office 365 is not doing this. Instead of from client side to the server, why not the opposite? So, uh, so the, if I understand the question, why is O365 not not doing this? Because they optimize everything after you hit the front door of of, for, of Microsoft. Um, they they don't optimize kind of in the in the last mile or the mid mile. Based on where you are coming from, yes. my question, uh, your DNS IP, okay, let them do the proximity routing and let them redirect you to the optimum pop location. Similar to Amazon's like low balance. people are doing it anyway. Right. This, this one. So th th the question sure. then becomes um, the underlying network characteristics, right? Sure. Do you have IPMKS versus DNS. Which one they are doing, I don't know. But uh, why o you are doing this? So if they will do, then uh, all the other SD web vendors will get the benefit as well, right? Yeah, so a question of Microsoft, does it want to get into the network measurement, uh, understanding how network characteristics are, and then route it around it? I mean, the DNS part can be answered. That's relatively straightforward. But using the network characteristics to figure out like the most optimal path, I don't know if, if it's in Microsoft's. OK. We can ask them. <laughs> question. <coughs> um, so what? this is all largely DNS-based. What if you're using the umbrella options with the SDI WAN or SD mm -hmm. uh, WAN solution as well. Yeah, so even with Umbrella, uh, there is the whole concept of having different facilities where you're doing DNS. 
again, the, the, the idea over here is that because we're using that custom endpoint, uh, you're still going to be returned in anycast IP. And the idea with that anycast IP is that when the actual user resolution happens, it'll get resolved to an IP over there. So yes, it is possible it may not be the closest one if you're going to use Umbrella. But yeah, the idea is with that anycast IP, you're still getting something close enough. And then you have the SD-WAN fabric still doing those probes to make sure it's, it can at least choose the best path among all the circuits you have to get you there. All right, so uh, I think I, I'm running a little short in time, so I have five minutes. So I'm quickly going to go through a demo. So um, in, in an effort to save time, we've just kind of pre-recorded this. So let me maybe set the stage for this a little quick. So uh, for this demo, right, what we did is we have a uh, branch router set up at uh, Sydney, and we have a data center set up at uh, Mumbai. And what we're trying to do is we have um, uh, a file on OneDrive uh, sitting in a data center by somewhere near Singapore. So traditionally what's going to happen is uh, we're going to show you a file download. Uh, what will happen is this will take the traditional path. That means the file is going to flow through the data center and then all the way down to the branch. And we're going to see how long that file download takes. And then we're going to enable Cloud on RAM at that particular branch. That means you're going to allow him to break out directly. And then we're going to see how the file download, how much time the file download takes after that. All right, so let's go ahead. How, how real is this demo versus simulator? These actually hosts that are in these locations you're suggesting? Yes, yeah, yeah. So okay. we, we use actual hosts in these locations. We actually set up a, a OneDrive folder in a data center by Singapore to kind of simulate so it's not too far from both places. And then we record it after that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we, we wanted, just to your point, th this is very real. This was done in, in on the real environment. The only reason we recorded that is because um, internet performance can vary. Um, so we take sort of like an average approach not to react too fast um, to transit changes on, uh, on the internet. So that's why it, it's a matter of minutes potentially that the reaction will happen. We didn't want you guys to just sit and, but other than that, this is all done in real, real life. Yep. So uh, like I mentioned, so this is the PC that's sitting at a branch in Australia, and we're going to be downloading this particular file uh, from OneDrive. So when we start the download, we'll just take a quick look at how long it takes, and it should just be not too long. So this is, again, the file download happening all the way you know, through the data center before we've enabled the uh, Cloud Express feature, or Cloud OnRamp. So that took like you know, 56 seconds, not too bad. So now we're going to go to vManage. Uh, we go ahead to the top right, and we enable Cloud Express, or Cloud on Ramp for SaaS. So you'll see that it's already enabled right now for O365, but uh, at this point in time, the only way out is via the Mumbai data center. Uh, one quick thing, maybe before this moves forward, is you'll see something like uh, the VQA score. So what we've kind of done is, instead of having a user try and you know, interpret parameters of loss, latency, and how they impact applications, and having to set SRA based on those, we kind of abstract all of that and put it into what we call a VQA score, a quality experience score. So the idea is, if you have anything, uh, it's, it's a score from zero to 10. If you have eight to 10, your application's working really well. Uh, if it's uh, lower than eight, uh, like four to four to seven, it's average, and below that, it's really bad and it needs attention. So the idea here is you're looking at uh, you know the score of the application specifically for O365 is seven out of ten over here. Uh, this traffic is going through the Mumbai data center, and that's and the reason you're seeing an alarm over there is because it needs a little bit of attention. It may not may not be the best uh, experience from an application perspective here. So what we go ahead and do is uh, we click on uh, Manage Cloud Express and we say let's you know, make this particular branch at Australia a direct internet access enabled branch. So I'm going to click on uh, the Australia branch, uh, add it to my selected sites list, and click on Attach. And that's pretty much all the config you have to do to enable this uh, DIA. So here, this is the part where we actually kind of just sped it up. Uh, this is the part where it goes in, applies the configuration in the background to the particular branch location, and then the branch location will begin doing probing across all these transports. So it knows already that it has a path through the Mumbai data center. Now we've told it that, hey, you can also potentially break out directly from the branch uh, and try and access O365 from there. So it's begun doing DNS over there, it has done probing, et cetera, and we've kind of just sped across that part of it. 
so now uh, you'll see that over here we see uh, 40365 is active on one side and now you'll see for this particular uh, application through the Australia branch, it looks like we're getting a perfect score of 10 right now. So let's make sure this is you know, really the case as well from a download perspective. So we'll go back to that uh, host PC and we will just try the file download again. And uh, that should be it, 11 seconds. So if I had a mic, I'd drop it here, but yeah. <laughs> uh, on, the, on the VQOE score, are you able to tweak the metrics uh, or even per application? Uh, yeah, so today what we do uh, inherently in the solution is we have baselines that we've determined based on some cloud endpoints to determine base latency loss parameters. And based on that, we have a based on that baseline, we you know compare it to what the SD-WAN fabric is giving us in terms of data, and that's how we give the score. So today, it's not tweakable as such; it's something that's built into the system based on some parameters that we already know what's good for the application. Okay, you downloaded the same file, right? Yes. Uh, what about the physical uplink? Were they the same bandwidth? Yeah, we didn't change anything else uh, from uh, from that. I think he means in the lab, both locations to the web, oh, they were both yes. the same. Yes. They were same circuits. Yes. Bandwidth and all capacity that. was the same as well, right? Because yes. you are downloading. Yes, but the, the idea with this solution is your direct internet circuit could be anything really. It could be a bigger pipe or a smaller pipe. The point is to see that if I can get as close as possible to the SaaS application. In our particular scenario, we use the same bandwidth link on both sides, on, on the internet and, and our MPLS link. And the idea was to see that if I break out directly, am I really getting as you know, quickly as possible to 0365 or not. Is that, oh. is that score something I can drill down into and understand how it was scored? 56 versus 11 seconds, I mean, that must be an astonishing latency yes. to account for that. Yes. Uh, yeah, but today you can't go <coughs> down on the score to understand the difference. <coughs> That's okay. not visible today. Yeah. How you are calculating VQAE score? Last question. Uh, it is, so it, it's, uh, there's an algorithm behind it, uh, so I'll need a little more time to explain it, but the idea is, uh, based on the nature of SaaS application, loss, latency, jitter, we take all of those parameters. We have certain baselines. So around the world, we say that, okay, uh, 0365 in North America, these are baseline parameters. In Asia, there's so many. So baselining. Yeah, so there's baselining, and then we have an algorithm to kind of do some averaging based on that, yeah. And also, Ethan, to, to your point, is that uh, even though the score is abstracted, right? I mean, there's a score, right? So the, yeah. You can still go, and you can get the actual raw readings of what those probes have discovered, yeah. right? So that you're not blind to that, you know? The score is just easy for you to consume, but if you wanted to see the actual readings, you can do that. I'm a bit disappointed. <laughs> oh, it's a Mac. I was going to do some push ups real quick. Water? Yeah. Games. Classic. I think I was going to put that you put in the doorway. I was going to put in my suitcase. Anybody else? Water. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Huh? Make it Water. Ah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Water? Water. Okay. Make it in three, please. Hey, David. Can we get some reports on when the score is better on one, one of the two circuits? Let's say, for example, we have two paths to... Uh, Office 65 and, and, and okay. one path, the yeah. primary pass is yeah, sorry, not good at X, Y, Z. I would and, and, uh, take some more coffee. Okay. Black, please. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.
both. Click on it. It actually gives you a graph that you can stretch all the way from one hour to the past. And it will graph you what your experience was once. Thank you. I think it's on. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Two thousand eighteen, we still haven't figured out conference calling. And we still haven't figured out how to <laughs> do external <laughs> screens. <laughs> uh. Twelve plus years. Initially started out as a tech engineer. Put in my six and a half years there and took this technical marketing engineer role. I'm focusing on SD-WAN security that everybody before me touched on. We've talked to customers, I've been traveling all year since we started this SD-WAN security project since last October. Talked to hundreds of customers and we folded all of the use cases into these four buckets that you see. A group of customers tell us that compliance is the main focus for them. They want their enterprise branches to be compliant. In this use case, they tell us that they want to tunnel all of the traffic from the branch all the way to the headquarters. That includes the internet-bound traffic. That, of course, provides suboptimal performance, but that is the use case. That's what they want to accomplish. To be compliant, we could leverage the enterprise firewall that is application aware and IPS solution that we have. Since there is no clear traffic that leaves the branch going to the internet, the attack surface in this use case is very minimal. Another group of customers tell us that they have guests coming into their enterprise branches and they need to provide them good enough content filtering. So for this use case, we could leverage the enterprise firewall that's application aware, as well as URL filtering. This is an unbox feature that we could run natively on iOS XE SD-WAN image. Another group of customers tell us, well, I have my employees. I don't want to haul all of their internet traffic to all the way to the headquarters. And I want to pick and choose certain SaaS applications to get optimal performance and break that out directly from the branch to the internet. Still, continue to haul the rest of the internet traffic generated by the same employees to the headquarters. We call this use case the direct cloud access use case, picking and choosing certain SaaS applications such as O365 that Hamza talked about. Now, since in this use case, we're exposing the employee's internet traffic and sending it in the clear right out of the branch. Now the attack surface is even wider than the previous use case that you see. Yet another use case is what Hamza touched on, the direct internet access. Whether it is the employee's internet traffic generated <coughs> at the branch or the guest traffic that is generated going to the internet, 
all of the internet traffic will go from the branch directly to the internet. No internet traffic is tunneled over all the way to the headquarters in this use case. So we have the enterprise firewall that is application aware, intrusion prevention, DNS web layer security. All of these can be leveraged at this branch in order to protect the assets that live behind the router. Now, SD-WAN security brings all of these security features, the full stack, into Viptela's vManage to provide that single pane of glass that David Klebanow mentioned to be able to provide provisioning, managing, monitoring, reporting, as well as troubleshooting. Now, this solution can be cloud-hosted or, or on-prem depending on the customer's use case. The controllers could be spun up in the cloud or at the customer's data center. Now the security features, the embedded on-box features, I call them out, I don't have a laser pointer, but what you see in this bubble, that's the enterprise firewall that's application aware, IPS, URL filtering, and uh, advanced malware protection. So you're all able to see the color difference here in this bubble? That is great because that has been roadmapped and committed to be delivered in March 2019. The rest of the features are coming in this November. Now the only cloud feature that we will be integrating is the DNS web layer protection. We'll talk about each of the security features and look at the live demo, not the recorded one. Now, what features are coming in which platforms? In all of the Cisco platforms, ISR 4K, 1K, our ENCS, which is ISR V, CSR, ASR, as well as the uh, with Tala V edges. So we're really talking about, the, these are all gonna be baked into iOS XE-SD-WAN. Correct. A, as well as the Viptela V edge. Yes, I called out a little asterisk here to see. The ASR 1K will not get the IPS URL filtering or AMP because those three applications we run within the router's container. We take the control plane course, the spare course available, we run these as services using those control plane course. And those that technology is available on the ASR 1K, just not enough course to push all of the traffic that the ASR 1K is capable of processing. And so, the, so, so it, the software would end up being a bottleneck for the power that the 1K has, you're saying? Yes, uh -huh. it is capable of processing more throughput, but the control plane cores are just not enough. And the V-edges, these do not have the control plane concept, the container concept, so for the, that reason, they won't be getting the IPS URL filtering or AMP, which are the container-based applications for the November release. Mm -hmm. So on the ASR 1K, it's also a hidden box, right? So you typically, branch security is the ISR platforms. The ASR 1K is in a data center or in a hidden location where you would likely have dedicated security appliances anyways to do all of these. Now the enterprise firewall that is application aware, traditionally we've had a stateful firewall on our routers many, many years. We've integrated that with our NBAR application detection engine. So we're able to provide visibility into the 1400 plus applications that uh, uh, David talked about. <coughs> Thank you. You could block based on individual applications, group of applications, or category of applications and configure the firewall policy in one pane of glass. This offers segmentation and uh, helps with the PCI compliance of the enterprise branch. Now the intrusion prevention, this is also an on-box capability that we run within the router's container. The signatures are released by our Talos organization, the highest efficacy in the industry. vManage is the single pane of glass. What it does is 
at the set interval at pollscisco.com. As and when new signature set is released, it goes out and grabs that signature <coughs> set, the new signature set that is released, and pushes that down to all of the routers provisioned in vManage. The options that we do provide is to whitelist signatures should you see a lot of false positives. Creating new signatures or tweaking existing signatures is uh, not supported for the November release, although we're considering that for the future. This solution with our stateful firewall that is uh, application aware will make an enterprise branch PCI compliant branch. URL filtering, this also is an on-box capability that we're bringing in. We could run natively on iOS XE SD-WAN image as a container application or service. We provide about uh, 82 different categories that you could block or allow. Also, each IP address in the universe gets a reputation score on a scale of one to 100. Low reputation, high reputation, suspicious websites, medium reputation. So the customer can choose to block or allow based on that as well. Some options we allow are custom blacklist or whitelist. Even in the blocked category, you could specifically add one particular URL and say, I'm just gonna whitelist this. It doesn't matter which category it belongs to. Let the user go to that. And the custom end user notification. So if a user behind is unable to go to a category, then what do they see as a blocked page content? You could either tell them a message or write a message that they will see, or you could redirect them to call an 800 number to, and reach out to the help desk. And the next one is the DNS web layer security. Before I move on to that one, uh, many, of, uh, many of them ask, what are you doing do with the HTTPS traffic, right? So today, no SSL decryption, but what we do is watch the packets up until encryption starts. So the client hello after the three-way handshake and the server hello comes and the server presents its certificate. So we have the server's IP address and the domain name. So we're able to block based on that. But this onbox feature looks within HTTP as well as HTTPS packets before encryption starts. Now, how are you able to pass the like the block page, if you want to say that, to, to redirect and say, call this 800 number like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. If, because like we, uh, I know I've seen it with Firepower, when you're doing HTTPS yes, without it decryption, it it's just hard. like, cannot be displayed and I it kind know. of stops It's the there. same thing with our solution too. Connection okay. has been terminated is what yeah. you see. But if it is HTTP, we're able to insert that block page. Okay, so pretty much same exact boat. Same. Gotcha, yes. all right. right. The DNS web layer security, this is providing content filtering at the DNS layer. Certain countries have laws against looking within HTTP or HTTPS packets. So no way to provide content filtering if uh, the solution looks within the HTTP, HTTPS packets. So this solution intercepts the DNS packets. It doesn't matter where the destination is. We fix it up. We change the destination IP address to that of umbrella anycast resolvers and we ship the packet encrypted using DNS script after we add the inside client's IP address and the device's identity over to Umbrella Cloud. Now there, Umbrella Cloud, if you have Umbrella subscription enabled, then it sends the response back based on the policies configured there. If the category is blocked, then it sends its own block page in the DNS response. And if it is an allowed category, then it sends the end web service IP address in the DNS response so the client can open up a connection to that web page. Now on the umbrella portal, we do support the TLS decryption as well as intelligent proxy. Intelligent proxy is if the verdict is gonna be in the middle, gray, not white or black, then what they do is send their own proxy IP address in the DNS response. So when the client opens up a connection to the proxy, then the connection is, uh, the another session is proxied out and Umbrella gets the response to further look and see whether the web server or the response that comes back is malicious or not. Now advanced malware protection, this has been roadmapped committed to be delivered in March 2019. 
once our device is provisioned for AMP, what we do is we watch for files that get uploaded to the internet or downloaded from the internet over a few protocols such as HTTP, FTP, SMB. And what we do is we generate an MD5 hash for that and compute a SHA, and we cross-check with the AMP Cloud to see if it has seen the SHA. So if AMP Cloud has seen it, it will be able to give us the file reputation, whether it is good or bad. And if it hasn't seen it, and if the device is also provisioned with ThreatGrid, what we have is the capability to send the entire file to ThreatGrid, so they do the sandboxing there, and once they're done with the sandboxing, they send the verdict back to the AMP Cloud. So in the future, if the same file were to be uploaded from the internet or downloaded um, uh, to the internet, uploaded to the internet or downloaded from the internet, we'll be able to hear from the AMP Cloud. And this is still, you still see all of this through Jimenez, not through FMC. That is correct. Now moving on to this demo. I put this entire SD-WAN security demo on my UCS server. It is an M2 server, has a ton of memory and drive space. So that's what I decided to do. I don't want to take any uh, hardware, physical device, and plug-in cables in my home office. So that's sitting right at my home office. And the uh, direct internet access is through my Google Fiber router at home. Now I have, I am from RTP, North Carolina. So I put my headquarters in Raleigh, North Carolina. And down here I have two little uh, branch offices, and I have hosts sitting behind each of these. So to, for these hosts to talk to each other, they use this MPLS router. This MPLS router and this INET router, they're running the traditional iOS XC image. The other three routers, one at the headquarters and two at the branch offices, they are running the iOS XC SD-WAN image. Now with these host behind all of these branches and headquarters want to go to the internet. They take this direct internet path, the green line that you see, talk to my iNet router, also within my UCS server, and out using the Google Fiber network, they go out to the internet. So let's see how the vManage policy is all configured. See that screen? Uh, oh. <clears throat> All right, cool. So once you're logged into vManage, let me see if I can sit here show this better. So under the configuration section, we've added a security option here to be able to configure the security features. Yeah, trying to. <clears throat> All right, under the security option, we could create a new security policy. So once you do that, this is the intent-based use cases that we talked about. If you pick compliance use case, we show you the workflow for the features that are required for that particular use case. And if you choose the guest access use case, we show you the workflow for the enterprise firewall and the URL filtering that we can configure that can be run on the box. Direct cloud access and direct internet access, it's the same thing. If you don't choose any of those four, we can always go the custom route and proceed and start configuring your features. If you're not interested in firewall, just go next and go to the next feature. 
but I'll show you the feed, uh, security policy that I have configured here. Let's edit this policy. Now under the firewall section, I have added just four simple rules to be able to allow HTTP, HTTPS, DNS, and ICMP to go from inside to outside. This policy is going to be tied to the feature template, and this is the one that is deployed to all of the three CSRs that you saw on the topology. Now for the intrusion prevention, this UI is very intuitive. The only two mandatory items that we ask you to provide is what signature set do you want to implement between balance, security, and connectivity. We've already been asked um, from customers as to what the difference is between the three, and we're gonna add this little I that you see here uh, right here by the signature set so that it will show you what the difference is. The difference actually is the number of signatures that are enabled by default. The other mandatory item that we ask is, do you want IPS in line or do you want that in the detection mode? Meaning it will only show you what's going on but will not be able to drop packets should a signature be fired. And once that is done, just for the slick look, we put anything that's not mandatory under the advanced option. So this is where you would whitelist signatures should you see a lot of false positive. And we show you how to import that from the local computer very easily. You could add a new signature list. If you do that, we show you syntax, how that whitelist file should look like. Open a notepad text uh, edit and uh, add those signatures in the syntax that we show you here. And you can quickly import that from a local computer. It's just as simple as that. And uh, changing the log level. So those are the two items that we buried under the advanced option. So you get the slick look of the UI. And finally, enable that on the VPNs. Which VPN do you want? Both ingress and egress packets are subject to IPS. Now the uh, URL filtering piece. This is also a container-based application. Very simple, the UI is so slick. You uh, tell us whether you want to block or allow and what categories. We pre-populate all of the 82 categories here. It's just a matter of putting checks on these boxes and that will show you the count that increases as well as soon as you do that. And add that towards the end, the two categories that we added. And provide web reputation. Do you want your users to go to suspicious websites, high-risk websites? I would never want uh, our users to go, so my choice is to go allow only moderate and above, so low risk and trustworthy. And anything else that's not mandatory for this feature to work, we put that under the advanced option. This is where you could provide us a custom whitelist URL, all regex-based blacklist URL, as well as a blocked page content. So if it is, again, HTTPS page, we will not see the, the blocked page. It, it's just gonna show you connection timed out. Or if this uh, character limitation that we have here, I believe it's 256 characters, if that isn't enough, then we could simply redirect them to a completely different website that's hosted with the new company, or even outside. The DNS web layer security, let's uh, go ahead and edit that and take a look at this. This feature you can apply per VPN. So in this, um, what we could say, still not in the, where's the DNS piece? <clears throat> you can pick VPNs and say for this particular VPN, I wanna redirect all the DNS packets to umbrella. And for these VPNs, I wanna redirect the DNS packets to a completely different custom DNS server. It could be a Google DNS server or you know, Route 53 or other DNS servers. And under the advanced option, the DNS script is enabled by default, meaning we encrypt the packet after we add the eDNS uh, metadata, which includes the inside client's IP address as well as the router's identity. So once all of this is done, we show you the policy summary page. <clears throat> and here, 
for the container-based applications, we could specify which log collector, could be live action curator, any other Splunk log collector, an external log collector, the IP address of it, and which VPN it needs to take in order to get to that. Now let's go and see um, how to tie in this policy to the device template. So this particular device template, the CSR 1000V template is the one that is attached to the three devices. So I go here, edit that, and all the way down to the bottom is where we have the security policy. You could have multiple security policies based on use cases, based on different devices that you want to attach. And the next one is the template for our application hosting. So there's one little manual piece that needs to be done. This container-based application includes a um, or runs a virtual image that we need to upload to the software repository. So if you go here and click on the virtual image, this image is the one that runs our application in the container. So all of the provisioning happens automatically, but this is a manual step. We need to go to CCO, and this image lives exactly where the iOS XD SDN image lives. Grab that, upload it right here using the same UI, and it gets provisioned automatically. So now that the, the policy is all deployed, let's take a look at the overall dashboard. We've added uh, three new widgets on the bottom that you see. Starting November, release the 18.4 vManage. We'll have these uh, three widgets. The iOS XC SD-WAN image is 16.10.1 image that will be posted on CCO end of November. So here's the firewall widget. You can toggle between inspected and dropped. This gives you an overview of all three routers in your enterprise, at least in the demo top <coughs> that I have. Gives you one hour break, and you could switch to three hours, six hours, 24 hours, and seven days. So at any point, you can click and say, uh, see how many sessions the firewall has inspected across the three routers and process that. You could also toggle to dropped counters. I have scripts running on these um, Ubuntu hosts, so it constantly sends traffic to populate the data on the dashboard. So you could toggle, you could uh, look at the drop packets. Let's look at the, the past one hour, how many packets um, that these three routers have dropped. And at any point, you can click on that, and it shows the drops. At that point, it was 78 drops, and that happened on these um, three routers. So you can click on that individual router. It shows the system IP address, but then we've asked, um, we've been asked to include the host name instead of IP address, and we will be including the host name for the FCS release. So it shows you the reasons for which the firewall dropped these packets. So that, that amount of drilling down is possible here. What we do is uh, generate show commands and uh, keep sending them to vManage, and vManage populates that. The amount of disk space that you allocate to vManage, it's capable of holding data for a longer period of time. And if you have an API-capable device, it can make an API call and grab all of this information that vManage has. For the IPSPs, you could toggle between uh, severity versus count. The high severity is uh, color-coded in red and the medium severity in blue. And that, again, is the automatically goes to the 24-hour view. You could toggle that to the three hours to see what signatures got triggered in the entire enterprise across the three routers in my topology. So the two signatures have been triggered, one that went 481 times, and it's a medium severity. And this one triggered about 460 times, and, and that is the critical alert. So you could click on this particular signature, and we even show you the source IP address, so one in uh, VLAN 20, VLAN 30, and VLAN 10 on the topology, and the destination IP address that they go to, which VPN they belong to, and how many times the signature had, was triggered in the last 24 hours. And now moving on to the uh, URL filtering widget, this could also be toggled between blocked versus allowed. So let's look at the allowed category. It's not gonna populate all 82 categories here. We populate 
the categories for which we see traffic. So if you look at uh, the real estate category here in uh, yellow, this shows that we've allowed 12,706 sessions across three routers in the past 24 hours. We give you a breakdown of the, I know this is a pass, it needs to be renamed to sessions and it will be done. We filed a defect to get that addressed as well as populate the um, host name instead of the system IP address here. Now that covers the overall dashboard. Now if we look at the individual device dashboard, we go under the network. I have three edges, one in Cary, one in Durham and Raleigh. So we could click on one particular device to see what options are available. Here under the security monitoring, we have um, firewall intrusion prevention, URL filtering, as well as umbrella redirect. It's the same amount of um, drilling down that we offer. And uh, we show you all of the protocols that we allowed, HTTP, HTTPS, DNS, and ICMP, and the breakdown. Anything else that you don't allow here is gonna be caught in the class default. And intrusion prevention is the same thing that you saw in the overall dashboard. Um, URL filtering, about the same thing that you saw, maybe a little bit more drilling down. I'm being asked to just uh, <laughs> finish this session. But the umbrella redirect please, uh, piece I would like to show, this clearly shows that this device has successfully registered with umbrella and we've been redirecting packets. So at a what time and date of, um, date and how many packets that we redirected. We also provide an option to bypass local domains. If it is an internal only domain for which we don't have an A record created for the outside, then there is no reason to redirect those DNS packets to Umbrella Cloud. So this is again, pattern matching based on regex. I do have it configured, but not enough traffic to bypass that. For those DNS packets, we don't even touch them. We let that DNS packet to go wherever it was destined to go. The rest of the DNS packets, we intercept and fix up the destination IP address. And that completes uh, my demo today. If you have any questions, I'll take them at this time. Sorry, I went over a few minutes to come for the technical difficulty that I had. How do you like the UI, the dashboard, overall dashboard, the device specific dashboard? It's good, it's just a very security focus. I was just wondering, for example, who's gonna manage that? This tool has been fo very focused on NetOps versus SecOps. So that's why you don't see um, if you're familiar with the FMC management tool, that is geared more towards the SecOps, and this is geared more towards the NetOps. So anybody can take a look at it and understand what is going on. Well, I think even if you've looked at FMC before, this is very familiar. Like when you got to the IPS part and you were talking yes. about the different levels, yes. it's worded it's the, same the same thing. as a- It's the same thing, like um, David was talking about, right? We took our, um, uh, Rohan was talking about, so we did, it's the uh, F, the firepower piece, it's four IPS, AVC, URL filtering, AMP, and uh, uh, the ACL piece, right? The access rule base. So we separated the IPS and the AVC that they have, just took the IPS piece and we're running that. And that's yeah. why you see the same signature set, right? It's just the, when you, get, you see the signature set released for firepower, you see the exact same signature set released for these that we could download from CCL. Thank you so much for your time today.